There's loads of great stuff in this episode, but listen, before we get going, I would love it if you could subscribe, but as well as that, just hit the notification bell as well, because as soon as there's a new episode or something fresh from all of us, you will get it first. But for now, grab a pen and paper, because I think you might need to make some notes on this episode. It's full of brilliant takeaways. Enjoy. Here we go. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome to the podcast, the England Rugby head coach, Eddie Jones. Hi, boys. Pleasure well. to be here. Mate, thanks very much for joining us. So. In your mind, what is high performance? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you're always just striving to be better. I think when you're high performing, you've got a number of things working. You've got the right people. You've got the right vision. Uh, you've got the right environment. Um, but it changes all the time. Um, so I can't, I don't think you could say this is high performance. I think it's constantly changing. It's dynamic and, and your ability to, to observe and read what's needed for that environment at that time is the most important thing. So could you talk us through the process that you go through to observe, engage the environment around you and how you react to it? Maybe some real world examples of when you've had to change things. Yeah, well, probably the best example is Japan. Um, so I went there, um, a team that hadn't won a World Cup game for 20 years. Um, their average score against the top 10 country was 85 nil defeat. So the first thing I knew I had to change was their, the way they thought because they were happy to be losers and the whole rugby environment were, were happy for them to lose as long as they played well in the last 20 or 30 minutes of a game. So we just kept painting the picture in their head of of what they could do so we're a small team can we play faster than anyone else yes we can can we play smarter yes we can and then we created the the program to support that so it was just constantly driving that message we're going to be the fastest smartest team in the world train like it we train we changed the training day to three times a day, um, which the players hated initially, but by the end they saw it as a, as a medal of honour that they were able to train harder than any other team. Um, and it shows you where you can take people um, because the story shows they did well at the 2015 World Cup and did even better at the 2019 World Cup. See, that to me seems like quite a powerful approach that you take Eddie that in every team that you go into from the Brumbies right the way through to England that you don't come in with one set way you seem to adapt and be almost a chameleon to the environment what kind of things do you look for that give you a clue as to what uh, what you're going to um, shape it to be I think history is always one of the most important, the history of the team, the history of the players, the history of the society they're in. Um, you know, I think you've got to understand how the, how the players live their lives um, because that'll give you an indication of how they approach their sport. Um, and, and then um, you look at the people, you know, look at the people closely, see what they've been through, what desires they have, and how are you going to get some commonality? So you don't treat the whole team as the same. You work very much individually. Uh, well, I think, you know, when you are talking about teaching, one of the things I learned from teaching is that initially I did, first couple of years I did, I think you call it supply teaching here. Yeah, that's right. Where traditionally you get all the worst classes. So, you know, a teacher has a day off when they have the worst classes. So they're generally 15, 16-year-old boys. So I'd have the same 15, 16-year-old boys for six lessons, you know, be maths, geography, PE. And you walk into a classroom like that and you've, you've got to work out, right, who do I need to control? Uh, who's going to help me? Um, what areas of the, the room I don't have to worry about? So your ability to, to get a feel for the, for the group, I think, is important. Um, and certainly in teams, it's the same. You, know, you walk into a team for the first time and you look at the players, you think, right, who do I need on my side here immediately? Uh, who do I need to get rid of? Uh, who can maybe I can keep? And then you're working with those players. So what characteristics do you look for then, Eddie, when you walk into a room like that? So if, if it's somebody that you want to keep, uh, people that are going to be a positive influence that either have a, 
a massive work ethic or have great character. Like, you know, uh, probably a good example is Haskell with England. Uh, he'd been a bits and pieces player and he had something about him um, and, the, and you could tell the boys liked him, um, but he, was, he wasn't possibly brave enough to be himself. So what I tried to do was, was get him to be himself, like a big physical guy, play like that, don't be afraid to make mistakes, and then be that life of the, the party type character off the field. And you wanted that from him. How did you get him to that place then? Um, well, it's always the, the communication you have with them. Uh, I think at the start of the Six Nations, I guaranteed, guaranteed him a spot for the whole tournament um, to, to make him believe. Yeah. And maybe to take a bit of pressure off as well. Yeah, take the pressure off him, yeah. Because you always, you know, and you guys know better than anyone, that you're always either trying to put pressure on or you're trying to take pressure off and your ability to read what they need at that particular time is important. See, but one of the great skills that I would attribute to you, Eddie, is your ability to read a room. Like we've had Dylan Hartley on the podcast that recounted the story that you put in your own book about your observations were based on how he spoke to one of the staff at Penny Hill Park and how he treated them with courtesy. So what would you say are the skills to develop that ability to read a room that anyone listening to this could adopt? You know, what's your general manager of a hotel? I learnt more from general managers of hotels than anywhere else. Uh, I used to have a mate who had a hotel, a Millennium Hotel around here, and he used to run the the take out Hilton and I'd go and have dinner with him. He was a rugby fan and I'd just go and have dinner with him and I'd watch him and we'd have dinner and he'd give me full attention but he'd be able to see whether that way to put down the the knives and forks correctly and then he'd call them over and, and give them a word straight away. It was a brilliant lesson in observation, you know. You've got to you've got to be with the with the person you you're with, but at the same time be able to just keep an eye on what's going on and deal with it immediately. That's not something that comes easy though to a lot of people. I wonder, apart from just observing, how you honed that ability because one thing you can't do as a rugby coach is become myopic. You can't get obsessed, can you, on one minute bit of detail. You've got a number of hats that you wear. I'm always fascinated by how you wear all those different hats but make the person you're with at that moment feel like they're getting everything, all of Eddie Jones. Yeah, I think teaching helped, definitely teaching helped. Um, Are you surprised lots of teachers listen to this podcast? Uh, no, no, because I think teaching like coaching is becoming more complex um, and they're have, having to deal with more things. But I think, you know, as I said, with teaching, you had to, because you had the welfare of the kids. So you've got 30 kids, you, you've got to be looking and put yourself in the position to watch those kids closely, uh, be looking at the little nuances between kids, seeing, like the school I first taught at was quite rough, so... I had to be careful that the kids didn't break out in the fight, so you had to be watching, you had to be ready to, to intervene. And I think, you know, one of the problems we've got in sport at the moment, and I can probably speak more about rugby than any other sport, is that we've got a lot of kids now not being taught by teachers, sport, they're being taught by ex-players. And I think it's a, it's a fundamental flaw in education. You need, you know, kids need to be taught. Um, and they don't need to be coached at an early age. Um, and we're, we're trying to turn high school teams into high performance teams where they should be just development teams. That's one of my, probably one of my bugbears at the moment. So what would you say is a distinction between teaching and coaching? Uh, well, the end result. You know, with, with teaching, it's... You're always just trying to get the best out of the people. Uh, with coaching, whilst you're getting the best out, you can have a happy team and you have a contended team and a driven team, but if you're not winning, you don't get to do it anymore. So you've got to, you've got to drive that to be an effective currency in coaching, and the currency in coaching is winning. Our currency in, in education is, is building the child up. One thing I'm, I'm really interested in talking about on this podcast is, is self-belief. And we often discuss the fact that you might be wrong in thinking you can do anything, 
but there's no benefit to thinking that you can't. You might as well believe it, and if it happens, then great. And you, what you spoke about there when you discussed working with the Japanese team at the beginning, you said, oh, we decided to tell them that they'd be the quickest team in the world, the best team in the world. The, the power of your mind is such, a, is such a huge topic on this podcast. How important do you think it is, and do you think you can get any player to believe they're a better player? Or do you believe you can get any player to be a better player by believing they're a better player? Oh, I think it helps. It definitely helps. I, I, I think I read Arsene Wenger's book recently and he was talking about how he'd tell every player that they were the special player today. Yeah, and yeah. They'd, you know, he'd have 11 special players there. But getting players to believe, make him feel good, you know, that think, feel, act is, is so true. So you've got to get them to believe in themselves and believe in their strengths. And the really good players are the ones who, who manufacture their own game and they play to their strengths. Like the not so good players are the players who don't understand what they can and can't do. You know, and the great examples, you know, most test cricketers are great examples of finding their own game. You know, the, the, particularly batsmen who, who bat over 50 are the guys who, who cultivate their game. They might have a lot of different shots, but they don't play those shots because they know that the shots that they can play to be a successful test cricketer is this amount. Steve Waugh was a great example. You know, first came in the Australian side, had every shot. Average 30, got dropped, went back to club cricket and made himself so he couldn't get out. Came back to test cricket and was one of the greatest batsmen of all time. But how do you cultivate belief in yourself, Eddie? Uh, I've, got, I've really got no idea, mate. Um, I think one of the things that helped me, I had a stroke in 2013 and before that I thought I was Superman. You know, nothing could stop me. Um, yeah. I thought I was okay coach um, and probably since then I've become a lot more um, I don't know whether the word's compassionate but a lot more understanding of other people um, and that they don't have the same obsession for me for winning and and doing things correctly that they can do it in their own way um, and that's probably helped me create a better a better version of myself I think I think I'm not so, sure so what would you so Eddie before the stroke and Eddie after it, what would somebody see as the biggest difference between those two? Uh, I think that I understand now more about people's own internal motivations and they won't be the same as mine. Um, yeah, I wanted my daughter, who's now 27, to be exactly like me. Yeah. Driven, and she wasn't, you know, she was a pretty happy-go-lucky kid, didn't play sport hard, um, studied okay. I remember she got to grade eight in the violin at, at the age of 12 because uh, oh. my wife wanted her to play the violin and then she just quit. She said, no, I'm not playing anymore. Um, and she's turned out that she's, she went to university in England and she's turned out now she's working in rugby in Australia and she's, you know, she's at it all the time. So it's, it's funny how things turn around. But, yeah, I think, I think I understand people's motivations better now. So before the stroke, people who weren't buying into your level of discipline and motivation... What did you think before the stroke was the right way to deal with those people? And what do you think now is the right way? Because we have a lot of leaders that listen to this that struggle with getting the people in their team to come on the journey with them. Yeah, I think, you know, it was more of a do what I say. And if you don't do what I say, well, I don't have much room for you. And now I think it's more a balance of sometimes you've got to still do that. Um, but but now guiding people to where they can go, and particularly players now, like younger players now needed to be guided, and they're much better educated players now, much better educated in, in their psych psychological aspects, social aspects, skill aspects. So your ability to give them opportunities to, to find, find the best way to do it themselves rather than you telling them, I think, is, is the most important distinction. So why did the stroke do that? Um, because I think it, it made me realise that you just can't keep going, you can't keep doing it. You know, I was relentless. I'd work and work and work. Um, and when I had the stroke, I had to slow down a little bit um, and I had to think and I, I found God in that time. I uh, went to church, 
Um, and uh, so it was a pretty significant event in my life. See, what intrigues me on that, Eddie, is that you'd almost had a warning before this, hadn't you? I've heard you speak about your experience at Queensland where, yeah. where you were reacting to what had happened with Australia and you, and you almost uh, acted in haste and, and repented in leisure. Why didn't you learn the lesson at Queensland, but it took something like a stroke to finally make you aware? Uh, I think I was on the road, but I think the stroke hastened the, right. Right, hastened the journey, so to speak, um, and made me realise I needed to change. And probably I wanted to change before, um, and I think there's a big difference between wanting and needing. Sure. So How what did Mrs Jones say about, uh, about the difference? Uh, uh, yeah, we've had a up and down relationships at times, um, but I think she just takes me for what I am. Um, yeah, and we've she's she's been fantastic in that she's always there and supporting, but she's she she never has an active role, so to speak. Right. Which Eddie do you think she prefers? Um, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps you guessing. Yeah. I'm interested um, to just explore that relationship with God and why that, that's been significant for you and, and for your career. How has that changed things? Uh, just uh, it made me realise that I think we're all on, on earth for some sort of purpose and, and, and maybe the only thing I can be good at is coaching. So I wanted to make sure I, I maximised what I was supposed to be on earth for. There's again that great story out of Wegner's book where he, he goes up to, to heaven uh, and the guy at the gate comes up to him and says, what do you do, sir? Or what did you do, sir? And he says, oh, I tried to win games of football. And, and then the guy looks at him and says, surely you did something more meaningful than that. <laughs> so do you let being a rugby coach define you entirely? We've had Johnny Wilkinson, who obviously you know well on this podcast. He told us that doing the washing up is no less important than winning the Rugby World Cup because to win a game of rugby, you use your body to achieve a goal. The washing up is the same thing. And that if he put more importance on being a rugby player than a dad or a husband or doing the washing up, no longer being a rugby player means he's less important and he wasn't willing to accept that. Do you define yourself as a, as a rugby coach? Uh, I probably define myself as someone who has the opportunity to, to help improve people. So I think that's pretty important. Um, and I did as a teacher and now I'm doing as a coach. So that's, that's, I think that's pretty important to me. I would like to talk about the episode with Australia when you lost your job. What did that period teach you? Uh, well, I can remember losing it and thinking, I remember we went down to Canberra, we were living in Sydney, went down to Canberra and, and going shopping on a Saturday afternoon in Canberra. And I'd coached down there successfully. And people are looking at me as though I've committed murder. Um, and that was probably my perception. Um, but again, that was a that was a tough period, and I was talking to another coach the other day that just lost his job. And and one of the things I would have done is sat down for six months. I would have gone, maybe float down the Amazon or something, and just thought about everything I did, what I what I needed to change, what I what I what did I do well, and what did I need to change. And I was in too much of a hurry to prove people wrong, and that ended up. I didn't catch well for pro probably another two years after that. I was still hell-bent on proving people wrong rather than just coach and just enjoy the coaching process, um, which is what I do now. I love, I love coaching. I love making a team and, and trying to make a team stronger. So if, so if we talk about your coaching ability then, Eddie, if we think about the four pillars of physical, tactical, technical and mental, where do you apportion most of your energy as a coach? Well, I think tactical and mental are almost the same. Go on, say more about that. Well, I think the mental side is how you're thinking about the game and the tactical side is just the employment of those thoughts. Okay. And I think they've always got to fit together. I've been lucky enough uh, to have some great people supporting me. Um, I've got a guy called David Pembroke in, in Australia who... 
cultivates the media strategy. Uh, and we don't, I don't follow it 100% uh, because some of his ideas are way out here. But immediately puts he wants... He wants to control the environment. Um, and the best one was for that New Zealand semi. You know, we immediately went on, out on the attack at the start of the week. We wanted the New Zealand media to try to put pressure on the New Zealand team. You know, and we called them fans. We called the journalists uh, fans with keyboards. Um, and, and he created that idea of circling the All Blacks during their haka. Um, so I use those sort of people. I've got another sports psych who, who is a tactician, absolute tactician. So he'll say, they'll be thinking this, you've got to be thinking this. Now, how can you employ that? And he's got some weird and wonderful ideas. Again, we don't use them all. But I think that's one of the things probably being able to do okay is, is get that, that synergetic, if that makes sense. Yep. And I think all the other stuff's the easy stuff. Brilliant. In what way is it easy? Oh, getting players fits easy. Yeah. Uh, it's just effort. It's having the right program, having good coaches. And the, and the what was the other pillar? The physical, tactical, technical and mental. So well, and you put two of them together. at our level, it's not, not a great, you know, at international level, we don't really coach rugby. You know, we're just trying to get a team organised, thinking the same way. So when we interviewed Clive Woodward then, he spoke about the transferability of those skills, whether that was to his business or whether he felt he could go into soccer and do it there. What's your view on that? Uh, zero. <laughs> I've got no transferability. I'd well, love that's to. not true because you've just you've spoken about the fact that your career started out as teaching. I, yeah. I wonder whether you'd ever consider going back to teaching. I'd love to, mate. Would I'd you? love to be a director of sport at a big public school. Imagine on a Thursday afternoon walking around telling the kid to keep his elbow <laughs> up. Come on, come on, run a bit straighter there. It'd be fantastic. So why so why haven't you done that? What is it like? What's the itch that still keeps you coming into the furnace of international rugby? I want to coach the perfect game. How close have you got to coaching the perfect uh, game? Someone asked me the other day. I, the first year I coached, I coached our reserve grade team in in, in my club team, and we led at half time thirty two nil, and it was almost perfect rugby. Second half, we weren't so good. But now, you know, in a game of rugby, if you can control 50 minutes of the game, you'll win the game. And I want, I want a team that can, co- that can control it for 80 minutes. Imagine going out there and you're impossible to play against, impossible. When you've got the ball, they can't get it off you. When they've got the ball, they've got so much pressure, they're giving it back to you, and that's unrelenting. That would be fascinating. So what would you say would be the ingredients of a perfect game then for a team. So if you had to, so if you could instill characteristics in that team, what would they be doing that would deliver the, that outcome? I have to love the grind, mate. Because, yeah, you know, all the good things in sport are hard work. Yeah, you know, there's nothing in sport that comes easily. So you, the ability of the best players, and I think it goes to coaches too, the ability of the best players and the best coaches is to keep doing it and don't get bored by it, don't take any shortcuts, be insistent on standards, keep those standards high, never drop off. And that's what that separates the really great players from the good players and the good players from the average players, their ability to absorb that grime. Because everyone thinks sport's fun and fantastic, and it is when you, when you watch it. But the actual process of putting that into place is, is, is hard work. One of the things that people often ask us about when they listen to these podcast episodes is they question whether it's good for us to talk about the grind and the effort and the sacrifice and the struggle because they, they worry about the mental health impacts on people feeling they have to struggle to be successful. Where do you stand on thinking you have to struggle to be successful? Yeah, well, I think you know, high performance, if you have that term, high performance, is, is not the environment for everyone. Yeah. You know, and I, th- I think we've got to be quite clear about that. For some people, it's not right. Um, and there's other environments you can be in. Um, but if you choose to be in that environment, then you choose to make that decision to absorb that the pain, the, the choice of, of how you go about things. And, and to me then, of course, you've always got to worry about the welfare of the player. And I think increasingly today, we've got to be more careful about the welfare of the players. Um, 
But the players make that choice and coaches make that choice. But do you enjoy the grind? I love it, mate. Um, you know, I usually, at the end of a tournament, I get sick because I, I miss that grind. Really? Yeah. So how rounded do you think somebody can be if they, if they choose to go into a high-performance environment? Uh, look, I've, I've seen a lot of really good catches be, be very rounded. I don't think everyone can be. I don't think I'm a very rounded person. You know, watching rugby and match of the day is probably not too rounded, is it? <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I think you can be. You've just got to make the right choice and you've got to work out your, your work plan. Yeah, I'll give you an example for me. I was acting principal at this high school um, and we had our daughter and my wife said you can't be working 15, 16 hours a day. Um, so I, I cut back and I used to go in there Monday morning at, at 3am and work feverishly for about, about five or six hours before everyone came in wow. to get the week organised. Wow. And you can, change, you can change the way you work to, to get a better balance. Regardless of your career or industry, do you think that to be at the elite level, to get to the top, that is the level of relentless dedication that's required? Can you get there without that? Well, I think you have to have focus. I think focus is the big thing. I, I don't think the number of hours or, or the time or the volume of work is the important thing. I think it's the focus. And you know, again, I, I, one of the books I've read and I've spoken to this guy is that Cal Newport who's written Deep Work and just your ability to, to work out when you're the most productive yeah. and, and make sure you set that time to do The challenge for people in the modern yeah, world with social is. media 100%. and constant, this era of information. And to do the most difficult work when you're at your best. And then when do you, the- When are you at your best? Uh, either early in the morning or late at night. So how do you cut through all of the shit at that time of day to just focus? Well, I usually go in about 5am and 5am to 6am is usually my most productive time. But then after that, I I train where where I usually get some good thoughts where I'm not even thinking, but I usually get a couple of good thoughts for the day and then I'll go back to the office. So generally from 5 to about 8 is my best time. And the rest of the day, I don't try to do anything serious apart from just work with the players. And then I'll do a little bit at night again if, if I'm in the right mood. So to ask a personal question, Eddie, where does this relentlessness, this drive, this fire in you come from? Uh, well, I think it came from probably the upbringing. Um, you know, we were a working class family. I was half Japanese, half Australian, in a fairly tough, um, white Australia place so to be any good you had you had to get ahead you know and and you had to be good at sport so I wanted to be good at sport and and we were I think my mother did went to high school but she she was in internment camps father I remember I remember he always told me he said I was working at Goldmine's son when I was 15 and he did his he did his year 12 I remember him doing it when he was 50 because he still wanted to get it so we had that we had that nice um, just commonality about who we were, but the opportunities of what we could do. Um, yeah, my eldest sister's a director of a big architecture company. She's brilliant. She's a, she's got a couple of doctorates, I think, uh, lectures at a university. So she's driven in her own way. My middle sister's driven by. I, she just bops around from one thing to the other. She's, you know, she's taught nearly every subject. She's had her own uh, kimono shop where she's got kimono material from Japan and made it into modern clothes. Um, and she's a real sort of creative person. And I'm sort of the one that didn't get either. I'm not that bright or not that creative, so <laughs> I've had to work a bit harder. I think you've done all right. You've done all right. Lots of parents listen to this podcast. Um, in many ways, you are a parent to a lot of rugby players at all times and it's easy to get to the head of those guys they want to play rugby they want tactics they want to win what's the trick to getting to their heart that the parents listening to this podcast can can take on board i think yeah everyone's motivated by something um and whether it be desire to be famous desire to be good at something money mm. you've got to understand the motivation i think for most kids there's there'll be some sort of central motivation there and you've got to try to then work with them to find how that that can be brought out 
Um, I remember I did this show for a Japanese uh, television. We went to a high school um, and I, had, I coached them for a week. And we had to try to find out, we had to try to get the team good enough to beat a university team, which is obviously a higher level. And we beat them. And, one, and again, one of the most enjoyable kids, I remember there was this quite overweight prop um, and he was bloody terrible. Um, you know, didn't want to get involved in the game, stood back. And I, I wanted to get an association. So I gave him a nickname. Um, and then I, I did little bits of extra work with him all week. And he made this one big run in the game. And the, I can remember after the game, the boys were so happy for him. And I think that's the same in parenting. You've got to, you've got to just try to find how you, can, how you can get a strong connection on something they like doing. And kids these days, the hard thing I would say is the kids these days have so many things going on in their life. And maybe you've got to try to get them to focus on a, a few less things. Like a head coach, remember that nothing's neutral. Everything you say or do. Yep. See, but I was going to ask you around, so your own background of coming up in that, of being an outsider in a working class community and then being a father yourself and working in the sort of elite environments of, um, of England rugby now. How do you sort of get kids to tap into those fundamentals because they're almost entitled or privileged or some people have described them as being soft through conditioning of society. How do you cut through that to get to tap into that desire? Well, I think, again, for each player, there's a, there's a certain, certain way in, so to speak. And you know, I always remember a great coach of mine said, unless you're able to, to generate an emotional connection with a player, you won't get a result. And they've got to remember conversations you have. Like, I bet you can remember the teacher that you either liked a lot or disliked because he said something to you that either made you feel absolutely fantastic or made you, made you think, I've got to change something. And that's what you're always searching for, that one way to get that connection with the player to make them want to do something that, that's maybe uncomfortable for, for them that's going to make them a little bit better. And it's, you know, you're a bit like a... You've got to be afraid to be wrong. That's that's the hard thing, you know. And you can you can sometimes lose a player because you've gone the wrong way with them. Um, you know, we've got one player we call the bowling ball because that's what we want him to be, and he loves it. You know, he resonates with that, and that's that's become a way that he's changed the way he plays. So, is it one example of a relationship? that has given you the most satisfaction as a, uh, as a coach, where you built that relationship and seen, seen them blossom as a consequence? Uh, well, I coached in South Africa, I coached a halfback called Free Dupree, uh, brilliant player. And uh, he was the first South African to play Japanese club rugby. And he came over, I had a, like a really good professional relationship with him. Um, he was a... a He'd play the game two rucks ahead of everyone else. And then he came to, came to Suntory and played for Suntory and he just blossomed as a, as a person, uh, became a real leader. Japanese boys loved him. He really uh, uh, changed the way he was and, and you could see the growth. And then, then he played in the, he won the World Cup in 2007, played in 2011. Hadn't played any international rugby until the 2015 World Cup. Didn't play for nine months. Then for the rugby people out there, they'll remember the semi-final he played against the All Blacks where they nearly beat them. And he was absolutely brilliant. I've never seen a guy who was able to start as quite a shy Afrikaans boy to blossom into this global star. And as a coach, you only get one chance to make a first impression. What are your tips and tricks for day one in a new job? What are the things you always make sure you do? Always try to light their eyes up. Yeah, that's, that's the main thing. Show them where they're going to go. And then the coach's job is to create the pathway to take them there. But always work from the, the end backwards. So this is where we're going, boys. Um, this is what we're going to have to do to get there. Uh, now make a choice and set that in stone almost right from the first day because you want people to be part of something special 
You know, you, you want them to feel like this is going to be something that no one else is going to do and that and that they've got a part to play in this and then you'll get a bit more out of them. Cause, how, how do you choose the thing, though? Uh, well, I think it's generally it's pretty... In rugby, it's pretty obvious. Like, you know, for England, we wanted to win the World Cup, but now it's more than that. We want to be a, a great team and I know we get criticised for saying that because it's putting ourselves... But why not? Why wouldn't you want to be? Who wants to be an average team? So what are you doing differently with this? Because there's a pattern here with after you, you wanted to win the World Cup in 2003 and then you've uh, in the final you lost and then you went on that second cycle where things started to unravel for you. What are you doing differently with this, with this second cycle of the England team you've got now than what you would have done with Australia? Real focus on being great uh, rather than winning. Right. Um, so it's almost... Yeah, they say the difference between process and the outcome driven. I don't. I never think it's as, as clear as that. Yep. But what we want the, to focus on is the, the players more themselves, rather than. It is important what the team does, but I want the players to be the best version of themselves, and and we're giving them a lot more ownership. Like on a Monday, they now come in and they work out what they're doing before lunch. So they've got to organise their coaches to, to work out their schedule. And it's just those little changes we're trying to bring in. We don't have wellbeing anymore. Right. So when they come down in the morning, if they're, if they're not right, find, find the person you need. And, what, and, 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 what different, and, and what's the skill that you're trying to develop in them um, by doing that? Uh, get the team to be much more self-regulated. Right. You know, I think the greatest teams or any organisation is the self-regulation is the important thing where the members of the team drive the team. It's not the leaders who drive the team. The leaders are just pushing and prodding and, and guiding, but the team's driving the team. Um, and to be a great team, that's where we need to be. And, and again, you know, the game on Sunday was a, a step in the right direction for us where we had to, we were about 3% off. They were playing out of their skin at, at particular times and we had to find something in ourselves. And the players found it. You know, no one else found it but the players. Brilliant. Your relationship with failure, how do you develop a relationship with failure so it doesn't derail you? I think there's a whole cycle of success and failure that you just keep going. So I know now we're right at the end of what we're doing now. Now, that might seem we've just won nine games in a row, been a World Cup final, won basically two Six Nations, but we've got to break it and, and go again. And that takes some pain um, because it means that we might have to change some personnel, might have to change some players. It means we might have to change the way we play a little bit. So, And you don't know whether that's going to be successful. And we do know what we're doing now is successful, but... That's you just gotta you gotta acknowledge that failure is always there. That it's a it's the biggest part of the 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 cycle. You know, if you have a cycle of leadership, it starts with failure, ends with failure. But then you've you've got to minimise that cycle. But when you're in the failure, to have sustainable practice within your organisation. Brilliant, look, Eddie, to sit and have that forty five minutes with you is just an absolute pleasure for us. And I think um. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Eddie that we're talking to now is quite a different Eddie to the one that we perhaps would have had a conversation with 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, possibly. <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure, guys. I've really enjoyed chatting and doing a, a great job with the podcast. So thanks for the invitation. Thanks. And thanks for listening, by the way. I know you've listened to a few. They're quite important conversations for people to hear, I think, don't you? Yeah, no, they're great. I, as I said to you off air, I, I love that Matthew McConaughey one. I thought <laughs> that was quite unique. And I, I bought the book. I wasn't so enamoured with the book, but uh, it was a great, great podcast, guys. Thank you. Well, Thanks a lot. Thanks, boys. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Eddie. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.